Father, as we have heard your word read, we prepare now uh, to Lord to listen to you explain to us what it is that you want us to understand. I pray, God, that your spirit would come upon us and that in a powerful way, Lord, uh, you would speak to our hearts and minds. We pray that you would teach us and convict us. We pray that you would draw us closer to yourself. We pray that, Lord, you would allow Jesus to be lifted high so that we might see the contrast between who he is and who Herod and the kingdom of this world, what that is like. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would be drawn to your kingdom. Thank you, God, that we have the opportunity to be a part of your kingdom. Thank you, God, that you have invited us uh, to join you in your kingdom. And God, I pray that as we spend this time in your word and preparation uh, for the time of communion, that our hearts and minds would be drawn to you and that you would just keep us from the distractions of this world and allow us to focus on you and what you are doing among us. For you are a great and mighty God, and we've gathered together to worship your name. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Which kingdom would you like to be a part of? On the one hand, we have the kingdom of the world, as represented by the story that you heard read from Mark 6. On the other hand, we have the kingdom of God. The beautiful words that were uh, displayed for us, but represented in the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And the question for us this morning is, there are two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. And the question is, which kingdom do we want to be a part of? I invite you, if you're not there, to please take a Bible and turn to the book of Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, if you're using one of the church's Bibles, uh, they're in the rack in front of you, it's page 817, Mark chapter 6, we're going to be looking at the stories that Kirsten and Tim just read for us from Mark 6, 14 to 29 and from verses 30 to 44, and as we do, I want you to notice the contrast between these two stories, it's not an accident that Mark has placed them back to back as we're supposed to recognize you have two different kingdoms at work here, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, as exemplified in these two stories by two people who claim the title king of the Jews. On one hand, you have Herod, who titles himself the king of of the Jews, and we hear his story in the first half of our passage. And as we think about this story of Herod and John the Baptist and the beheading and this banquet that he throws, I want to go through this with you and point out three characteristics that are true of the kingdom of this world, but especially true in King Herod. The first one is found in verse 16. This is the introduction to the story. The story is actually told as a flashback. At the moment that Mark is describing, people are talking about how great Jesus is and the miraculous powers and things that have been at work in him. Everybody is abuzz. Who is this guy? Where did he get this power from? And people are speculating where in the world. Clearly, this is from God. How, who is he? Well, everybody's got their answer. Herod gives his answer in verse 16. When he hears about all that Jesus is doing, he says, John the Baptist, who I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. And here we see the first characteristic of King Herod, the first characteristic of the kingdom of this world, and that is he is plagued by past sins. He's plagued by past sins. Herod's an interesting character. The Herod that's talked about here is a man named Herod Antipas. He is the son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great's the one we know from the Christmas story. When the Magi go to visit Herod, that's Herod the Great, his father. Not long after Jesus is born, Herod the Great dies, and his son, Herod Antipas, takes over for Herod the Great in the region of Galilee. On one hand, this Herod, Herod Antipas, was a great builder. 
he commissioned and built 12 cities in Israel. On the other hand, he's a pretty morally reprehensible character, as evidenced by the fact that he divorced his first wife because he fell in love with his brother's wife, who happened to also be his niece, and he steals his brother's wife from his brother, divorces his wife, and marries this woman named Herodias. John the Baptist sees this and says, that's not from God. That's not right. And then Herod does an even more morally reprehensible thing. He has John the Baptist beheaded. At this point, when Jesus is going around doing these miracles, Herod says it must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. And we see that in the kingdom of the world, in Herod's world, there's no grace. There's no forgiveness. He's sure that all the evil and the wicked that he's done is going to come back to haunt him. On the outside, he may be confident and conky, but on the inside, he knows what he's done is wrong. He liked John. He knew John was a prophet from God. He had John beheaded, and he's sure that this is going to come back to haunt him. Second characteristic of King Herod and the kingdoms of this world. Verse 22, when the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. Now that may seem like an innocent enough verse, but while you and I may have in mind Herod, now this is not actually his daughter, this is his stepdaughter. Herodias already had a daughter. When he marries her, she becomes his stepdaughter. We might have in mind this cute little girl in her tutu coming in to do a little ballet recital. Everybody claps politely and off she goes. That's not what's happening here. She's probably, the daughter's probably a teenager, maybe a young adult, and this is not a sweet, innocent dance. This is a sexually provocative dance. We're pretty sure she's not a little girl because her mom tells her to go ask for a man's head on a platter. That's not the kind of thing you go and request from a little girl. She understands what's going on, and she's there doing a sexually provocative dance, which is why the word pleased is being used. And the second characteristic that we see of King Herod is that he is controlled by his lusts. She's dancing for him, <clears throat> his stepdaughter. And in the midst of this excitement and arousal that everybody is feeling, he makes a promise that he never should have made, which is, I'll give you anything you want up to half my kingdom again. That's not the promise you make to the cute little girl in the tutu who's coming in for her ballet recital. This is the promise that you make when your lusts are driving the decisions that you're making. Herod is going to come to regret this promise, but in the moment, he's overcome with excitement and says, whatever you want, I'll give to you. And the second characteristic we see of King Herod is that he is controlled by his desires and his lusts. The third characteristic shows up in verse 26, it says the king was greatly distressed because the girl goes and asks her mom, because she wants to please her mom, what should I ask for? And the mom says, the head of John the Baptist. Verse 26, the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. Probably the right way to read that verse is because he made his oaths in front of his dinner guests, he did not want to not do what he said. You see, the point is not that Herod is a man of his word and, well, I made a promise, I got to stick with my promise. That's not what's going on here. What's going on is 
Herod made this statement in front of all of his guests. And the third characteristic of King Herod and the kingdom of this world is he is motivated by what others think of him. See, it's interesting that his stepdaughter says, bring me the head of John the Baptist right now. I mean, who brings a severed head to a dinner party? I mean, that's it's going to take all the fun out of the evening, isn't it? Why does she want it right now? Well, because as soon as this is over, he's going to back out. He's going to back out on this. She knows if I don't get him to do this right now while everybody is watching, he's not a man of his word. He'll find some way to say, no, 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 I didn't really want to do that. Herodias has been trying to get John the Baptist killed for a long time, and Herod's not been willing to do it. But now the daughter's got him. And so she says, right now I need that head. And even though Herod knows it's wrong, he's more concerned about how others view him. He's concerned about his vanity. How does he appear to others? And so he does it. King Herod, plagued by his sins in the past, compelled by his lusts, and motivated by what others think of him. Mark contrasts that story with a very different king. And in the story of the feeding of the 5,000, another banquet, if you will, we see in this story three characteristics of King Jesus. The first one is found in verse 31. Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. The first characteristic that Jesus demonstrates, exemplifying the kingdom of God, is concern for his disciples. Jesus is at the height of his popularity. People are coming from all over. They want to hear him. His teaching is revolutionary. They've never heard anything like this. Jesus is doing the thing that he was given by God to do. But in the midst of it, he notices that his 12 disciples are exhausted. And he says, you know what? Let's go out of here. Let's go get you guys some rest. Notice he doesn't say he needs the rest. They need the rest. Could you imagine Herod doing this for people who worked for him? Jesus is concerned for these disciples. He's not simply here to accomplish some tasks and to run people into the ground just to get them done. He represents God in the sense that God created us and gave us Sabbath rest because we're not simply cogs in a machine. And Jesus is concerned for his disciples' health and well-being. And he says, let's go get you guys some rest. The second characteristic, verse 34, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. Second characteristic, not only does he have concern for his disciples, he has compassion for all people. As opposed to Herod's feast, which is just him with his rich cronies. Jesus sees the poor, the lame, the blind, the outcasts, everybody who's gathered together, and he has compassion on them because they are like sheep without a shepherd. It's a beautiful metaphor. His disciples are exhausted. He's like, you guys go rest. I'm guessing he would have wanted some rest too. But here's all these people, and they're in need. And he's moved by compassion for them. It's a beautiful image. Sheep and a shepherd. It explains why Mark in verse 39 throws in a little detail that we might have missed otherwise. Jesus directed them to have all the people sit in groups on the green grass. Well, where else are they going to sit? Of course they're going to sit in the grass. But it's an illusion He's their shepherd, causing them to sit down in green pastures 
where he feeds them? It's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He causes me to lie down in green pastures. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This is the picture of that compassionate shepherd God who sees his people who are hungering, who are in danger, and he has compassion on them. That's Jesus. All people, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, Jew, Gentile, come and eat. The third characteristic of King Jesus and the kingdom of God, verse 42. They all ate and were satisfied. Do you think anybody left Herod's banquet satisfied? Watching a sexually provocative dance by the king's stepdaughter? and then finishing the evening with a severed head on a platter? Do you think anybody walked out of that banquet saying, it's good to be alive? (laughs) Do you think anybody thought this is what life is supposed to be? But Jesus' banquet, even though he only starts with five loaves of bread and two fish, people eat until they are fully satisfied. Can you imagine them sitting on the green grass saying, man, that was good. I'm stuffed. And there's more left over. And the point is Jesus is generous to provide to the point of satisfaction. Not only is concerned about his disciples, compassionate for all people, he is generous to give to satisfaction. Question is, which of these two kingdoms do you want to be a part of? Which of these two kings do you want to follow? Which of these two kings do you look to and say, that's the one I want to be connected with? Herod? Plagued by his past sins? Motivated by lust? Concerned only with other, what others think of him? Or Jesus? Jesus? Concern for his disciples, compassion for all people, able and willing to give generously until people are fully satisfied. God says there are two kingdoms in this world, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. And the question is, which one do you want to be a part of? Now, these two kingdoms not only manifest themselves in these two kings, We see them other, we see this idea other places in Scripture as well. I'd like to show you two more. If you would, turn over in your Bible to a little book called 3 John. It's all the way near the end of the Bible. If you're using one of the church Bibles, it's page 989. If you go all the way to the end and you find Revelation, if you back up, there's a little book of Jude. It's right before that little book of Jude. A short little letter of 3 John. It's a letter from the Apostle John writing to a church. Now, I want you to hear me very carefully. He's writing to a church because what I'm about to show you is the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. You not only find those in Israel at that time, in Herod and in Jesus, you find it in the church. Watch what happens. Third John, I'm going to start reading in verse 9. And listen for the contrast. We're going to go 9, verses 9 through 12. John, the apostle, says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. Meaning, he's a church leader who won't recognize or welcome an apostle of Jesus. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Does that not sound like Herod? Loves to be first. Spreads malicious rumors and refuses to be hospitable. That's the kingdom of the world found in the church. He's a leader in the church. 
Now, we might be tempted to say, well, maybe he does really good work in the church. Maybe he's helped lead people through a building project. Maybe he's helped uh, the church find favor with their community. But look what God says. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. It's not accomplishments that matter. It's character. It's how you act. And the Apostle John says, you can find the kingdom of the world smack dab in the middle of the church. We all know that, don't we? We've experienced people with Herod's personality or Diotrephes' personality right here in the church. You may think, well, we're part of the church. We're all part of the kingdom of God. No. Here's the kingdom of the world resident in leadership in the church. But notice the contrast. Verse 12. Demetrius, on the other hand, is well spoken of by everyone, even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. Does not Demetrius sound like Jesus? Everybody speaks well of him. The poor, the rich, black, white, old, young, Christians, non-Christians, because of his compassion, because of his character, everybody speaks well of him. And then John says, even the truth itself. What does that mean? Well, it's an allusion to the fact that in his gospel, John reminded us that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That Demetrius looks like Jesus. And so, thank God, in the church, you can also find the kingdom of God. But simply because you're in a church doesn't mean there's no kingdom of the world present. And so to all of us sitting in church this morning, the question remains, which kingdom do you want to be a part of? There are Diotrephes here, and there are Demetriuses here. And the question for us is, which one do we want to be? Let me show you one more arena where these two kingdoms play out. For this, I need you to turn back to the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Proverbs is sort of in the middle of the Bible. Church Bibles, page 536. Other Bibles and church Bibles. Find Psalms. It's one book uh, to the right of Psalms. So really pretty much in the middle. Proverbs 29, two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. We see it play out in the gospel of Mark in King Herod and King Jesus. We see it play out in 3 John in the church between Diotrephes and Demetrius. In Proverbs 9, here are the two kingdoms playing themselves out in the world, meaning in our schools, in our businesses, and in the governments of the world. Listen to what God says, beginning in verse 2. When the righteous thrive, the people rejoice. And again, listen to the contrast. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Notice it doesn't say, because Herod accomplished lots and lots of tasks, because Diotrephes accomplished lots of lots of things, he was a good ruler. No, it says that because they were wicked, people were groaning despite all the accomplishments they've, they've done. Likewise, why Jesus was such a great king and is such a great king is not simply because he fed 5,000. It's because of the righteousness of his character. People want to say character doesn't matter. That's not what God says. He says when you have people of good character, those who are being led by those people rejoice. And when you have people of immoral character, it doesn't matter what their accomplishments are. People groan under the weight of the wickedness of sin. Two kingdoms. Keep going with me. A man who loves wisdom, verse 3, brings joy to his father, but a companion of prostitutes squanders his wealth. Which would you rather have? Would you rather have wisdom? Or would you rather have a person who spends all their money and time with prostitutes? 
And again, when we spend time with prostitutes, we don't mean spending time to share the gospel with prostitutes. (laughs) Verse 4, by justice a king gives a country stability, but those who are greedy for bribes tear it down. What kind of company you want to work for? One that's headed by a person who loves justice or one that's headed by a person who's greedy? We look at titans of industry and we say, look at all they've accomplished. God looks at them and says, do they give justice to all people or they only care about money? Verse 5, those who flatter their neighbors are spreading nets for their feet. Evildoers are are snared by their own sin, but the righteous shout for joy and are glad. The righteous care about justice for the poor, but the wicked have no such concern. Did Herod have any concern for the poor? Did Diotrephes have any concern for the poor? (laughs) He worked in a church and kicked all the poor people out. How can you do that? But Jesus, he wanted to feed every person who showed up. Demetrius, the poor, the rich, everybody spoke well of him. See the contrast? Verse 8, mockers stir up a city, but the wise turn away anger. If a person goes to court with a fool, the fool rages and scoffs, and there is no peace. The bloodthirsty hate a person of integrity and seek to kill the upright. What did Herod do? What did Herodias want done? Verse 11, fools give full vent to their rage, but the wise bring calm in the end. Who do you want for a teacher or a coach on the athletic field? Someone who gives full vent to their rage or someone who remains calm no matter what mistakes you make? The question is, two kingdoms. Which one do you want to be a part of? There's not a third choice here. There is the kingdom of the world and there is the kingdom of God. There is Herod and there is Jesus. There is Diotrephes and there is Demetrius. There is the wicked of Proverbs 29 and there is the righteous of Proverbs 29. There is no third choice. And the question that's being laid before you today is, God says, I give you the choice between life and death. Choose life. All of which brings us to our time of communion. At communion, we are reminded that Jesus chose to feed 5,000. As we get ready to celebrate this ceremony or this rite, Let me say two things. First, to those who are not yet part of the kingdom of God, this is your invitation to come and join. How did Jesus invite people to be part of his kingdom? He threw a banquet and gave them food. This morning, you are being invited. If you are tired of the kingdom of this world, If you have experienced in the world, in your workplace, in your school, in your home, in your own life, the kinds of things that you're hearing described here, the kinds of words that are on these pieces of paper, people who simply want to escape, people who are interested in being entertained, people who are slaves to sin, being constantly striving and never getting anywhere, being consumed by lust being concerned with fame instead of being known. If you're tired of this king, listen, this runs through everything. You can find it in church. You can find it at home. You can find it in this country. You can find it in the world. When we talk about, look, Lord have mercy, what is going on with these mass shootings? That's the kingdom of the world. And if some point you're tired of that kingdom, yes, you don't get to stop going to work or going to school or living in this country or living in this world, but the offer is on the table. Would you not rather be part of a different kingdom with a different king that will last for eternity? And the question for you this morning is, if you're ready to join the kingdom of God, if you're ready to accept Jesus as king, when the tray comes by, there's going to be a little piece of bread and a cup. Just simply take one. That's your way of symbolizing your acceptance of the offer. 
Jesus provided the bread. Jesus provided the cup. If you're willing to accept him as king and you want to be part of his kingdom, all you got to do is do what the people in Mark 6 did. Is when the food comes by, you take it. And you eat it. And you experience satisfaction from God. If you're not ready to do that, that's okay. Please just let the bread and the cup pass you by. We're glad that you're here. But please, think about this. There are only two kingdoms. There are only two kingdoms in this world. And the offer is between life and death. Second thing I want to share with you. And this is for those of us who are a part of the kingdom of God. There's always a danger that our eyes begin to take notice of the kingdom of the world. And we look around at the titans of industry and how much they've produced. And we look at famous people. We look at the superstar athlete in our school or the really intelligent intellectual person or the beautiful person or the powerful person at work or we look around in the government and we see people seem to be accomplishing lots of things and we start to have our attention drawn to such people and we think, look at all they've accomplished. If only I could be like them. If only I could accomplish the things that they're accomplishing. And what we don't notice is that we're beginning to give honor and praise to people for whom the Bible does not say honor is due. We begin to call the King Herods in our workplace, in our schools, even in our families, in our country and in this world, we begin to call them blessed. And we've forgotten that there is only one king who ever chose to give his life so that we could have eternity. There is only one king who is righteous and good and kind. There is only one king who actually loves every single person, even those who are his enemies. There is only one king who is compassionate and kind. There is only one king who is concerned for you and for me. There is only one king who is king of the world for eternity. There is only one king that is due all the honor and the glory and praise. And while we've been distracted by the money and the accomplishments and the fame and the beauty and all the things that this world seemingly has to offer, we have taken our eyes off of the king of kings. And this morning I'm inviting you to tell him you're sorry. That in reality what Jesus has offered is far better than what Herod could ever give you. And that the contrast between the two could not be more stark. And so if this morning, as you take that bread and as that cup, if you need, as a Christian, to apologize to King Jesus, this is your chance to do it. And know that he's the kind of king that will graciously and gladly forgive you and erase all that from your record and continue to love you and bless you.